Okay, well, w welcome everyone. I'm David Weinstein, uh, the uh, director of the Center on Japanese Economy and Business, and um, uh, and the Carla Schaup Professor of the Japanese Economy at Columbia University. Uh, we're delighted you've joined us for uh, today's talk. Will the National University Fund generate innovation at Japanese universities? Uh, before turning it over to uh, today's speaker, I want to just briefly introduce the center, which we also uh, call CJEB. Uh, it was established in 1986, and our mission is to promote knowledge and understanding of Japan and its business systems in an international context. Uh, and we continue to grow our research initiatives, uh, programs, and events, and other activities. Um, I'm really honored to introduce uh, today's speaker, who is an old friend and colleague, um, uh, Professor Takatoshi Ito. Uh, he is director of our program on public pension and sovereign funds, and he's also uh, associate director of research at uh, CJEB and uh, professor of uh, the School of International a professor at the School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, as many of you know, Taka is a distinguished economist and scholar with and uh, uh, wide-ranging academic and policy experience. He's the author of the best-known uh, book on the Japanese economy, the textbook on the Japanese economy, um, and has taught extensively both in uh, the United States and in Japan. Uh, he's been a professor, a tenured professor at the University of Minnesota, at Hitotsubashi University, uh, the Graduate School of Public Policy in, um, at the University of Tokyo, um, and uh, has been president of Japan's Japanese Economic Association, uh, and also a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, since 1985. Uh, he's been teaching about uh, the Japanese economy and Asian financial markets, uh, certainly for as long as I've known him, which is uh, uh, well over uh, 25 years. Um, Taka has a broad experience in government as well. Uh, he has served in international organizations such as the International Monetary Fund, uh, and he was a senior advisor in the research uh, department uh, between 1994 and 1997, uh, and served in uh, Japan's Ministry of uh, Finance as Deputy Vice Minister for International Affairs from 1999 to uh, 2001. Um, he's also, uh, in, in, uh, his, his uh, tremendous contributions to the study of the Japanese economy have been uh, recognized by the Japanese government. Uh, he, in 2011, won the National Medal with Purple Ribbon uh, for his outstanding academic achievements. Um, we are really fortunate to have uh, Taka here today. Uh, he has been uh, giving these annual lectures on the Japanese economy uh, for nine, nine years, or so this is his ninth uh, lecture. Uh, he always selects very relevant and significant uh, issues for his lecture, and uh, they're one of the high points of the, of the lecture series uh, for me. Uh, today he's going to discuss a topic that I think is extremely important for, for Japan, um, which is uh, Japan's National University Fund. Uh, this is a, an important initiative to try to increase uh, the research capacity uh, of uh, Japanese universities and the Japanese economy as a whole. Uh, it is uh, going to have an asset size of uh, 10 trillion yen, or about 70 uh, billion US dollars. Uh, and uh, Taka and his um, work has been uh, really uh, impressive in, in this and other, in other areas. Um, before I turn the floor over to Taka, I want to thank our corporate and individual sponsors, uh, which, who are listed in the booklet uh, you received, uh, for their generous <coughs> donations. Uh, events like this and all the other programming that we do would just not be possible without uh, this kind of support. Uh, so thank you so much for, for uh, all of that. Uh, Taka is going to talk for around an hour, um, and then we're going to open it up for question and answers from the uh, uh, audience. Uh, so, uh, as he's going, um, you know, uh, jot down your your, your <coughs> questions. 
Uh, and then afterwards, we're going to have a reception um, uh, where you can get some food and drink, and, uh, um, and, and Taka will be up there for, for, for some time. Uh, and um, also, if you want to just learn more about the activities that the center is doing, you can follow us on X, uh, which used to be uh, known as Twitter, uh, and LinkedIn to stay updated on our activities. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, I want to turn the floor over to Taka, um, please. And uh, I'll sit down and uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank you, David. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to be here to give another uh, annual lecture. And uh, this year, I chose a topic on this National University Fund and uh, the um, Takuetsu University program, which they have started. So, um, OK. So here's the uh, sort of um, takeaways. So Japanese universities are low ranked in the global university ranking. There are several rankings, uh, but most um, um, I, I'll explain um, how the uh, ranking works. And the, I put the blame on the government funding, shrinking government funding since 2004, so the money is, uh, is um, uh, sent out of the controversy. Now, the um, 2021, someone um, was very concerned and hatched the idea that we need to create a university fund, just like American universities have large funds to help the university operations, that we need to create a fund and distribute the, um, uh, uh, the proceeds from investment to the select universities to bring those uh, research capability of the universities up to the par with the top global universities. So the fund is designed to come rescue the Japanese uh, research universities. Now, question is uh, two part, two, two, twofold. That one, that uh, could this uh, university fund generate enough returns to distribute money to uh, universities? And two, given that is uh, succeeded, that uh, will the money uh, be spent on the the research and teaching and all those activities which will actually help the Japanese universities' uh, research capabilities. Okay? So um, first, I'm going to explain the background and mechanism and, and so on. And the last part will be more speculative, what is going to happen. Okay? So basically, uh, the fact is that, yes, Japanese universities are low ranked compared to what you might think. And um, uh, that, is, um, uh, co that is causing, I think, some of the innovations uh, not happening uh, in Japan. I will give some examples. And here comes the rescue, the university fund. OK, so this is a ranking. Okay. And uh, this is the most um, frequently used global university ranking. And uh, uh, it is uh, called um, uh, Times um, Higher Education Ranking. And in Japan, it's, it's you know, reported, uh, broadcast um, when it comes out, new one, which was the last month. And um, <coughs> top-ranked Japanese University, University of Tokyo, is uh, 29th. The second one, Kyoto, is 55th. And Tohoku is the third in, among Japanese and ranked 130th. Okay? And you know, given that Japan is the third uh, biggest uh, economies in the world, that you think these are rather poor uh, results in the ranking. And just as a reference, the uh, top 
uh, ranked is uh, University of Oxford and uh, Stanford, followed by Stanford, MIT, Harvard, and Cambridge. Tsinghua University, 12th, and Columbia, 17th. Okay? So this is a, sort of the benchmark, and this is a reason why I'm saying that Japanese university are, uh, universities are low ranked. Now, there are scores in this ranking, which is disclosed, which you know, results in this total score, and ranking is uh, depending on this total score. So we can see which category that Japanese universities are low ranked, that you know, aggregated into the total score. So teaching, research environment, actually is not bad for Tokyo University compared to the top ranked and, and let's say compared to Columbia. And uh, industry, this is the industry income, is also not bad for um, Tokyo and, and Kyoto and Tohoku. What is um, most lacking in uh, Japanese university uh, quality is uh, research quality. This is basically citation. So if the professor writes a paper and it is mostly cited, then they are judged as a, that's impact uh, to, to, the, uh, to the world, and you get higher scores. Okay? So research quality, basically citation, uh, is low among the Japanese universities, and also international outlook, which is how many foreign students, how many foreign uh, uh, professors. It's a diversity in terms of the um, uh, nationality. So those are the two major items that Japanese universities are ranked low. Okay? <clears throat> so th this is the sort of background of how we uh, think. Now, so ju just I took the Columbia, because we are at Columbia, and the University of Tokyo, which is uh, top ranked among the Japanese, and just compare those in you know, particular uh, contrast is the research quality. So Columbia University's professors are writing the uh, impactful papers, and they are cited uh, in uh, many times. And University of Tokyo, they write papers, but does, uh, they do not have as much impact as uh, Columbia uh, professors' um, papers. And international. You, you could see if you walk around the campus of Columbia and the campus of Tokyo, the Tokyo campus is um, uh, uh, dominated by Japanese um, uh, students and uh, professors. Okay, but, but the, by the way, so international outlook has very uh, small uh, weights in the calculating total. So basically it's the research quality which pulls down the Japanese uh, universities, okay? So um, in the next few slides, I, I'm going to compare Colombia and Tokyo because of we are in Colombia. Okay. <clears throat> so first, uh, the tuition. Okay. So uh, just the tuition of University of Tokyo compared to the uh, tuition of Colombia, and excluding those room and board and uh, first year students. Uh, 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 entrance um, uh, fee and, and, and so on, just com compare tuition only, okay? And I did the calculation and the um, Columbia tuition is 18 times the Tokyo University tuition, okay? And you can say Columbia is too expensive or University of Tokyo has very best uh, cost performance uh, either way, you can uh, inter interpret it. Um, but you can ask whether really, you know, Columbia education and research is 18 times better than University of Tokyo. And uh, we can, we, we, we have to dig into a little bit more. So now, number of students is uh, very much comparable. And, and this is also in the T-H-E uh, uh, ranking and uh, uh, staff, to students, there, there are um, 
uh, staff to student ratio uh, is uh, better for Columbia that there are more staff to uh, help students, twice as many. International students, very different, and um, uh, that is the statistics. Then I dig into the, um, uh, uh, the accounting documents. So there are, there are profit loss statement, both in Columbia and University of Tokyo. So compare that the um, size of the budget, so the bottom uh, row. So size of the budget, it's um, uh, I, I converted to U, uh, US dollar, so it's like um, uh, uh, three times. Uh, budget is three times at Columbia. How do they get revenues? The, uh, uh, of course, tuition uh, uh, in, at uh, Columbia, uh, tuition revenue is much higher than uh, Tokyo. And also, um, and risk, the uh, government grants, the uh, University of Tokyo, the share of the government grants is higher. And look at the investment income, private gifts, and grants. Those are the uh, big uh, share combined, uh, 20% at Columbia. Basically, there is no those investment income and uh, uh, private gifts and, and, and grants. Those are donation only 6% uh, in University of uh, uh, Tokyo. So revenue, structure, revenue size is different. Revenue. Uh, uh, contents uh, are different. Okay, how about expense? This is very difficult to compare because um, I looked into those documents and it's very difficult to, to see whether the, um, uh, uh, they're, they're comparable or not. And, and they say education and um, uh, they could mean uh, uh, slightly different um, uh, things probably. Comparing the um, uh, expenses, that um, again, uh, the, um, uh, uh, there are some difference in, in the uh, education and academic um, staff, but I think it's not as uh, stark difference as uh, revenues. Okay, so I compared again from this uh, profit loss statements um, the um, uh, how many students uh, there are. And here the difference is that the, there are more, uh, the, at the University of Tokyo, undergraduate and graduate students are about equal in size. And the Columbia uh, graduate students is uh, three times as many as the undergraduate. So it's more into research oriented uh, in uh, uh, at um, uh, Columbia, and uh, the, this uh, trend is the same for, for example, University of Chicago and other universities. Graduate students are more important for the universities than the uh, undergraduate. <clears throat> okay, and uh, number of staff uh, is um, actually uh, much more at Columbia. And um, uh, administrative, administrative staff is um, um, uh, three to one. Uh, Columbia, more uh, administrative staff. Basically, University of Tokyo uh, professors have to do much of the administrative staff uh, kind of um, uh, uh, duties. And that takes up the uh, time of the professors. And uh, that, that shows up um, uh, in here. Okay, so uh, this is a part that I, uh, in the beginning, I mentioned that uh, Japanese universities are uh, getting shrinking uh, uh, budget. So this is the um, uh, Ministry of Education provides the operational budget uh, to uh, uh, national universities, and uh, that is called Unekofukin. Uh, and the peak was 2004. And 2004, there was a reform of national universities, and it was called corporatize the uh, national universities. And um, since Ministry of Education logic was that, well, we're going to corporatize, and you have more free hands, you raise your own money, we're going to reduce the subsidies from, from the government. But 
the fact was that there wasn't much of the reform in what universities can do. And um, uh, the freedom was not that much increased. So it's just the shrinking the pie uh, for 10 years. Okay? So every year, an automatic 1% cut in the university, uh, university um, operational budget um, uh, subsidies from the government. And that is sort of across the board, egalitarian, draconian cut. Okay? And after 10 years, um, it was kind of stabilized, but never, never went back to the uh, previous level. So just imagine you're, you're uh, getting 1% cut for 10 years. That hurts. And um, uh, I think the Japanese national universities have not um, come back to the full strength after these uh, uh, draconian cut. Okay, so um, what's the, um, what was the university action when the university was told there is a 1% cut every year? Okay, so university says, okay, we, we have to cut the budget. How do you cut the budget? You got Italian draconian cut to the each department equally, right? So, but the, some universities were smarter than others. And some universities says, okay, we are getting 1% less from the government. We're going to cut the 3% to each department and so that we get some 2% at the central administration headquarter of the university and, and use those 2% to prioritize the important uh, uh, projects and subsidize the new projects like law school and public policy school, which were born at the same time, 2004. So uh, each department, traditional department, got the 3% um, cut. What does it do? It does no new hire. Just let the uh, old professors retire, but do not uh, uh, hire the new young professors to replace. So basically, this automatic cut and the egalitarian draconian response means that the positions, jobs for young professors, young researchers, uh, were getting much less, not 1%, not 3%, but probably 5% less. And the um, uh, department got really uh, scared that uh, they cannot hire uh, the permanent position uh, higher, so that they went for more conservative to uh, not to hire the permanent uh, uh, professors. So those job opportunities for young researchers were severely damaged um, after this um, uh, 10 years of the automatic cut. Okay, then Ministry of Education would say, oh, but we created, we expanded this competitive grants for universities, big competitive grants. So you write the application and go for the uh, big grants for the new projects or maybe interdisciplinary uh, project, uh, the uh, programs and so on. But there is a catch. Those uh, big grants, competitive grants, has a, has a term like uh, seven years, at most seven years. So, you know, if you win the, this competitive grant, yes, for seven years, you have a big budget. And you can hire uh, uh, personnel, but you cannot give tenure. So all the positions are temporary. All the positions are uh, term appointment. And again, you cannot hire young professors to this kind of comp uh, 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 with comp uh, competitive grants. Yes, you can hire probably near retirement process because you know that position will, will disappear uh, in uh, uh, five years or seven years, but no new uh, young professors. And um, uh, PhD students in Japan still paying tuition and no salary. At Columbia, PhD students um, don't pay tuition and get the uh, actually salary. Um, actually, they are um, uh, UAW workers. <laughs> so uh, there's a big difference in, in the, um, how the graduate students are treated. 
in, uh, uh, in Japan and the US. So there is no wonder that the younger, bright students comparing the opportunities in graduate school, uh, so bright undergraduate students considering how you know, carry out should be uh, built, comparing the graduate student um, graduate school versus the going to the industry or banks. You know, the more students choose outside the university. So the PhD students, number of PhD students are shrinking in Japan. In this, you know, AI um, um, and the DX uh, uh, and bio worlds that graduate students in Japan are shrinking. This is incredible. So uh, just eroding the basis of the uh, research in, in Japan. Okay, so um, I, I would not claim all the, those um, uh, things which I'm gonna mention are due to this uh, lack of university research, but there are news we hear um, in, in Japan that we think, well, it's kind of strange or we could have done better, okay? Number one, we don't have you know, GAFA or GAFAM. And unicorns, um, unicorns in Japan are much smaller in size and they're not uh, breeding well. And so uh, number of unicorns are much smaller in Japan compared to the US. The Japan um, government subsidies and companies uh, uh, development uh, budget, a lot of money spent on this developing passenger jet. And after 11 years or 15 years, that this was, um, this was uh, suspended and terminated. And so there is no passenger jet. Uh, uh, assembled in, 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 in Japan, designed, assembled in Japan. And um, uh, messenger RNA, uh, mRNA, which this year's um, um, Nobel Prize was given to the, uh, this, the messenger RNA vaccine uh, uh, developers. And actually there is no COVID vaccine developed in Japan. And um, uh, some researchers try to create the uh, vaccines, uh, COVID vaccines, in old ways, and they failed. And it takes longer time in old, old uh, technology. Messenger RNA is much faster in, in development, and you can, you can um, uh, uh, re-engineer to the new strains of, of the COVID. So messenger RNA was the, uh, uh, was the um, sort of the game changer in the vaccine uh, making. Actually, there was a Japanese barista who was studying messenger RNA. But the research budget was cut, it was terminated. So he couldn't go on to, uh, to do uh, research in uh, uh, messenger RNA. I, I feel really um, that uh, it was a missed, uh, missed opportunity. Um, Rocket, the um, newer type, H3, the first one was not successful. And of course, semiconductors, that um, Japanese semiconductor, they can make uh, probably 40 uh, nano, but the top edge is now the two nano. And uh, Japanese um, have to invite the uh, Taiwanese company to come to Japan and build a factory in Kumamoto, okay? So this is stark difference from 19, uh, early 1980s. The US was complaining that Japanese are uh, having a too, too, much, too, too much share in, in, uh, in uh, semiconductor making. So the US government demanded Japan to import the foreign made semiconductors and they had to do some um, uh, quantitative targets for the imports of the semiconductors Okay, so the, these are the phenomena I can think of, you know, well, there may be some declining uh, innovations, declining uh, scientific power, 
uh, in, in, in engineering uh, in Japan. Okay, back to the main track. Um, so then someone came up with the idea that we need to create this um, uh, university fund where, you know, designed after Harvard uh, fund, Columbia fund, and um, uh, to get a returns from asset management and help the university. But in this case, government will do it for universities, uh, not individual university uh, fund. <clears throat> okay, so um, you have to come up with the funding, right? So you um, go to either budget or the borrowing and um, give, give those money to a Japan science and technology agency and create asset management team in uh, JST. Okay, so where is the seed money came? Uh, so, so this is structure. Government uh, will get the um, sort of the taxpayers' money, uh, general budget, and borrowing from the market and um, uh, create this National University Fund in the middle and uh, hire the investment managers and generate about 3% returns. So the 10 trillion yen, 3% uh, uh, means uh, 300 billion yen annually and give it to select universities, not across the board, but five or six hopefuls for the globally competitive uh, research power. Okay, so this was, this scheme was, um, was, um, uh, was um, designed in 2021. Okay, so you have to think of how to get the money of those um, uh, 10 trillion and how to create the fund managers uh, team and how to uh, make the reference portfolio to uh, give the guidance to the these team. Those are the uh, planning back in 2021. And I was a chair of the uh, coming up with a benchmark portfolio, reference portfolio for, uh, for this fund. Okay, so the first money uh, they, uh, they got was gold. Where was the gold? Gold was, um, gold was sitting there in the um, uh, Ministry of Finance um, department of the, um, you know, those gold coins. And gold coins is, you know, money making uh, uh, business that you create the gold coins and sell it at the very high price and high price is commanded because some collectors of those coins uh, uh, pay those high price for commemorative, um, uh, uh, commemorative uh, uh, coins uh, for the, the, you know, celebrating the reigns of the emperors or the Olympic games and, and, and so on. It used to be very um, big business for the government to uh, minting the gold coins, but the popularity of the gold coins somehow declined, right? So there, there was a, you know, the, they're hoarding the large amount of gold, and uh, that was criticized by the other uh, accounting agency among the government, that why are you using, uh, hoarding this gold? So Ministry of Finance thought of it, how better use this gold. So this is a scheme, right? <laughs> and um, the government, um, uh, uh, one, one, one department in the Ministry of Finance held this gold, sold it to the uh, foreign uh, reserve arm of Ministry of Finance. So it's just within the Ministry of Finance. Then the equal amount value of the foreign bonds was sold to Bank of Japan, and Bank of Japan paid the same amount in yen back to the Ministry of Finance, and Ministry of Finance give the, to the general budget, and so general budget was funding this National University Fund. I thought it was clever, you know? 
So somebody came up with the scheme, and I thought it's very clever. But that's the origin of actually first money of the National University Fund. Um, I believe some clever politician working with the bureaucrats came up with this um, uh, uh, scheme. But that's the first uh, money that the University uh, Fund got. Okay. So that's the um, uh, fiscal year 2020, uh, 500 billion yen. That's the gold. The next fiscal year, fiscal 2021, uh, they actually, this is the taxpayers' money they funded, um, uh, 611. That's the, basically um, the capital component for the uh, National University Fund. That's the money they don't have to pay back. That's a, the that's a money gift that they got from the government. The other 89% uh, were actually borrowed money. So the Ministry of Finance issued the so-called Philip bond to the market and get the money, and they loaned that to the, uh, this uh, university fund. And this is how they issued those bonds. Uh, 4,000 at the end of um, uh, 2022, then uh, 800 times six times, and now it's a 10 trillion yen fund. This timing is kind of important that um, they, those team was assembled and given five trillion yen, not 10, but five trillion yen in March 2022. And they were told, you manage and uh, come up with a 3% return. Now, that's uh, very difficult because you don't have many st staff experts. So there was only one CEO and a few people and given 5 trillion yen managed. And uh, uh, that, was, that is why I'm coming to it, that uh, the initial investment was not so good. Uh, but so after uh, 12 months, then uh, now it's 10 trillion yen, and this is the first year uh, of serious asset uh, uh, management. Uh, the team was expanded, and also it's now full 10 trillion yen. Okay, so 11% equities, 89% borrowed money, and how much risk can you take? By the way, so the borrowing, so those bonds issues and, and those money was loaned to this university uh, fund. And um, um, so question is how much risk can this fund take? Um, this is long-term bonds, and for 20 years from now, they don't have to pay back. But from 21st year to year 40, they are supposed to pay back the principal. So yes, 20 years, you can make 3% return, distribute, and fine. But from 21st year, you have to pay back equal portion every year. So maybe 3% is not enough. Maybe you have to get a 5% return, then build up the reserve so that even after paying back those 89% uh, of the money, you still continue this uh, university uh, fund. That, so that's... The, um, that's the uh, plan, but it's 20 years uh, long enough that you don't have to worry about it from 21st year on. Um, the another part is that, so this is borrowed money, and lending part is the Ministry of Finance, uh, uh, this field department, and they say, well, this is a borrowed money, uh, and uh, I lend you, but we want to be sure that you pay back, right? So don't take too much risk. Well, if you, we don't take the too risk, then we cannot generate returns and to distribute to the university. So there was a, so the catch-22, right? So um, that, was a, uh, that was a debate also. OK, so um, when I say 3% tar target is 3% returns, Many of my Japanese friends tell me it's too high. You, you never be able to get 3% returns. And my American friends say, 
Taka, 3%. Why it's so low target? <laughs> right? So uh, there, is a, there is a very different um, asset management um, uh, standard or culture uh, in uh, Japan and, and the US. And of course, the US, we, we have this uh, Columbia uh, uh, fund, and um, Columbia management uh, uh, is um, managing this fund, Harvard, Yale, uh, all major universities now have this fund management, which is generating 10% return or higher. So on, on average, in the long, long term. So of course, they think that university fund, the long-term investment, would generate the higher returns, 10% and, and more. And the source of that is taking risk. And, but it's long-term investment and they can invest in the e-liquid assets. And that's the origin for this premium that they can, they can get. That kind of you know, investing in e-liquid assets, taking risk for long term, and generate higher returns. That's not in Japan. So uh, you know, Japanese friends feel 3% returns too high is uh, you know, coming from that kind of um, uh, experience or no, non-experience. Okay, so um, my committee was um, tasked with uh, come up with the um, uh, reference portfolio, which will generate 3% controlling risk. Okay, so uh, we hired some uh, uh, financial advisors and have them calculate that what the you know, ratio between the bonds and, and, and equities and how much um, uh, risk associated and how much returns you can, you can expect. And uh, there was some back and forth, but uh, we came down to the number 65-35. Okay? You may think it's too much risk. You may think it's too little risk. And 65 global equities include the uh, public equities and private equities and alternatives uh, are there. Okay, so um, during the back and forth, that um, um, there was two, two issues. One is that what if the fund makes huge loss in one year or two years? Okay? And the Minister of Finance said, then we should shut down the fund. And uh, we, we said, no, 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 we are talking about long-term investment. And yes, in the global financial crisis in 2008, all those long-term funds suffered 20% loss in one year. Okay? But you know, they come back if you hold on to it. So we said the crash in the market is time to buy, not the time to sell. So we have to write in the, uh, we call it um, playbook, that what if the market crashes, don't sell, but buy. So that's the sort of principle that and we, we say, and we have to persuade the Minister of Finance that uh, this is going to be a uh, principle that we hold. Another one was which um, we, um, we are uh, stubborn, insisting it, is that the philosophy, philosophy of investment of this national um, university fund should be to maximize returns, controlling risk. Maximize returns, controlling risk. Which means that we calculate the uh, risk metric and fix that and go for the highest returns you can, you can take. Don't be shy to make a lot of profits. Why did we say that? Because the um, other big fund called the GPIF um, has a law which says the go for the target return minimizing risk. So they set the target return but minimize risk to achieve that. So this is, a, I, I think, two very different philosophy in fund management. To control risk and 
maximize the returns, or set the target and try to um, achieve it with minimum risk. Okay, of course, the global standard for the um, uh, pension funds and, and, and uh, endowment funds is to maximize returns with controlled risk. So um, we finally achieved that in, uh, in writing down the language. We're going to go for the maximizing returns, controlling risk. Okay. So, um, so, however, unfortunately, the first year results, uh, which is the uh, first full year of um, investment, was from uh, April 2022, last year, to March this year, this fiscal year 2022. And returns, total return was negative 2.2. Okay, where does it come from? From bonds that had a large negative return. And equities was uh, um, surplus, but the uh, proportion was actually low. So domestic bonds, they, so this is the, so this is a little bit um, misleading because this is the end of the fiscal year, which is a 10 trillion yen fund. But this returns were generated during the year, which they started from 5 trillion and increased to 10 trillion. So to be precise, you have to go month by month and how they invested and so on, which is um, uh, uh, not um, uh, disclosed, but the, you can understand. So I, as I said, you know, at the um, March last year, the small number of uh, uh, management team was given five trillion and manage. And what do they do? What can they do? Well, they want to be a little bit conservative um, this um, uh, long-term benchmark portfolio, so they went to for go for they went for more bonds. So they bought long-term bonds in U.S. and, and Japan. This is spring of 2022. The long-term interest rate in U.S. was about to go up, and the price of long bonds uh, about to go down. So that was unfortunate timing. And those conservative was um, conservative um, uh, investment was, turned out to be a bad decision. Moreover, that, that is sort of kind of excusable because the losses are all unrealized losses and they can recover in the long, long run. But the, um, I, I would say, um, I'd like to say um, it is um, more than unfortunate that, um, uh, that they made a currency hedge. So uh, in the spring of 2022, currency hedge means that you, um, the, you basically buy forward uh, rate, forward dollar yen, and uh, uh, that is a good bet. If the yen appreciates, then you're hedged uh, because the interest rate in Japan is much lower than the uh, U.S. Uh, interest rate, forward rate is more into the uh, yen appreciation, but yen actually depreciated. So any hedge positions they had made a huge uh, uh, losses. And that is included in the bonds returns. So some of the bond returns, negative, comes from the uh, evaluation loss of long bonds, but some of them are actually realized losses from uh, currency H, okay, right. So that I, I wrote down uh, in detail how the interest rate differential and the forward rate uh, works. So the reason the first year they made a loss, which some people heavily criticize, see, you cannot make a 3% return, you're a negative return, um, and so on. But I, I'm a little bit more sympathetic that uh, uh, this is the first year they try to be conservative and, and that backfired. Um, so um, that is the evaluation of how the first year return became negative, but I'm still hopeful that they can come back if they increase the weights of the um, uh, 
uh, uh, rates of the um, uh, equities. OK, so um, I mentioned briefly about GPIF. And um, uh, GPIF is a pension fund, Japanese pension fund. And um, uh, that has uh, 200 trillion yen. Uh, in, uh, uh, in, in their assets, 200, okay? So that is a pension fund. Now, university, national university fund is, if you can call it, it's a um, sovereign wealth fund in a sense. It's not pension fund. It's a, you know, comparable to university fund endowment in US, but it's not endowment, it's only, um, 11% endowment and 89% borrowed money. So it's a, a little bit difficult to characterize it, but it's government managed public money investment and GPIF 200 and university fund 10. So the size is 1 20th, uh, uh, but it's, it's a public investment, um, uh, sovereign wealth fund and pension fund category. So um, the size is uh, baby whale size is one twentieth of the mother whale. Okay, so the GPI, if you go to GPIF office, there is a big uh, whale on the display, and they're proud of being a whale in the pond. Okay, um, so um, GPIF it's a uh, pension fund, so they smooth out uh, the. Um, uh, transition from the uh, more populous economy to the um, uh, less uh, population and the pay as you go has a difficulty so they created a fund to smooth out those uh, uh, transition and make the pay, pay as you go system sustainable. That's the uh, GPIF and the target is nominal wage increase plus 1.7 percent minimize risk to achieve this. And National University Fund distribute income to a university. So the cash out is a purpose of the fund. And the target is at least 3% plus inflation. And philosophy is maximize returns, controlling risk. So results of this difference in the philosophy uh, comes down to the reference portfolio, which is 50-50 uh, for um, GPIF while it's 35-65 um, uh, in favor of more equities. And alternative is a, um, in, a GPIF, it says up to 5%. And in National University Fund, no limit. Uh, uh, so that's the sort of, the, it's, it's a baby whale, but it has more uh, aggressive investment uh, compared to uh, GPIF. Okay, and by the way, so the GPIF made positive return in 2022 fiscal year, and National University Fund negative return. The difference is that um, uh, how much equities you have. So, uh, although reference portfolios are 35, 65, it's much more skewed to bonds in the first year of National University Fund. So, as I said, I'm hopeful and more optimistic if the uh, National University Fund behaves uh, like mother whale and um, uh, increase um, uh, equities. Okay, so um, the last part is, okay, so given that we, I'm hopeful and 3% uh, return will be achieved in the medium term and 3,000, uh, I mean 300 billion yen annual returns will be distributed to the select universities. How do you select? Select universities. That's the question. And what do university recipient universities use that money for in order to uplift the universities to the globally competitive research universities like Columbia, Harvard, and so on. Okay, so they created um, a selection process, and the name of the recipient university is uh, Universities for International Research Excellence. And uh, let's abbreviate that to Takuetsu, 
which is a Japanese um, uh, Japanese um, uh, name for uh, this uh, category of the universities. Okay, so um, the first of all, so let's suppose 300 billion is um, uh, is a return annually, and let's say select um, um, five universities or six universities, then uh, it goes to be five, like uh, 50 billion to each. Takuets University, and this is big. This is big compared to what their budget size right now. Uh, I, I showed you the University of Tokyo budget, but uh, it, it has a significant impact. So it is serious money, serious size to make changes in uh, universities. Okay, so um, so at the University of Tokyo case. Uh, uh, it'll be um, total budget will increase by 20%. Okay, so um, this is a serious money and the selection is going on and the criteria uh, is, um, uh, is that university has to make a govern governance reform and you know, state what the money is for. How do you spend money? And uh, they, they you know, uh, uh, ask universities to submit the applications. Ten universities submit applications, and the based on these applications, three were selected in in the uh, for the second stage. In the second stage, the committee uh, visited the campus, three campuses, and talked to the um, uh, university uh, presidents and deans and so on. And um, uh, so University of Tokyo, Kyoto, and Tohoku, those are three universities you remember from the uh, top-ranked uh, Japanese universities in uh, THE ranking. Um, and the selection was made that Tohoku will get the first, uh, first um, allocation of the, um, the C University Fund, probably uh, second half of next year, or maybe 2025, but uh, that's the uh, that was selection. So it was um, greeted with greeted with a bit of a surprise that number three uh, in the ranking uh, get, and you know, University of Tokyo is um, much more well known and higher ranked in the global ranking. And why didn't Tokyo get it, and why Tokyo got it? So there's an application summary is published, and the selection committee's comments are published. So you can go to that, um, uh, uh, that why it was, you know, Tohoku was selected. But my understanding is that uh, Tohoku application was um, much more coherent and um, uh, showed some determinations and unity of in, in the application within the uh, university. And uh, Tokyo University application was centered around uh, creating a new department or school and school of design, and which is more interdisciplinary and, and so on, but was not really coherent within the uh, university uh, uh, plan. And that was my reading of the selection committee's evaluation of those um, uh, schools. So this is Tohoku University. And um, those are the um, you know, major contents and committee's uh, com comments. And that is uh, published okay, uh, in the website. OK. So um, will the National University Fund and Takuet selection be a game changer. Could be a game changer, but I'm not uh, optimistic yet. Okay. So I, I read those um, applications and uh, plans how to make uh, uh, university change. And I didn't see the exact so, sort of the important Ingredients, which I think important, uh, the ingredients of the of the making making universities top notch um, 
uh, universities. Basically, in the United States in the last 10 years, 20 years, uh, there was a major shift from all-round discipline to more skewed toward what we call in the US STEM, right? Science, technology, and engineering, and math. And there are, so that corresponds to roughly the natural science and some data science for social sciences. So um, uh, STEM at university level includes all the those chemistry, physics, and so on in the natural science area, but also economics and uh, statistics and uh, finance. Some of the finance areas are designated as STEM um, at Columbia. So um, uh, at the public policy school I teach, the, some programs like international finance is uh, uh, designated as uh, uh, STEM, and uh, but not all the uh, concentrations of the uh, public uh, policy school. So um, this is how the um, measures of the undergraduates changed uh, in the last um, uh, uh, 20 years. And um, uh, this is too small font you can read. The top, um, uh, I mean, increased uh, in, in the uh, measures, the undergraduate measures, were computer science, computer and electric engineering, engineering, math and statistics, biology and physics. Those are the, the, the measure uh, of the undergraduate expanded, uh, you know, 50%, 100% in the last 20 years. Okay, so that's the um, trend. And I think the undergraduate measures selection uh, and universities' acceptance of those increased demand reflect the society's demand. And those are the areas I think the uh, research was advanced and expanded uh, in the last 20 years in, in the US. Same thing didn't happen in Japan because those um, uh, measures were not um, not a student selection after they enter the university. The entrance exam are department specific entrance exam. Once you get in, law department, freshman, it's very difficult to switch to economics. Um, it is possible, but the number is very small. And um, uh, so that's the, those, those societies demand change is not reflected in Japanese universities uh, selection, uh, 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 concentration of the, um, uh, those students. So here, here's the, my idea. Uh, this is my personal wish list of how the uh, Takuetsu universities should be uh, uh, doing. Uh, first one is English. English is everything for the global competition, right? So uh, for those Takuetsu universities got money and give it to those departments should require that department and graduate school should be taught and, and in English and, and do the research uh, in English. Unless you write the papers in English, won't be cited and uh, uh, will not make any impact to the world. And second one is uh, related to the previous slide, flexible measures. Let the students, to, to, let students choose the uh, measures, what, what uh, subject they want to study. Third, allow double measures. So um, uh, dual measures. A student who is studying economics should be, maybe he or she is interested in law, then they should be uh, doing a double measure in economics and, uh, and law. Or economics and the uh, physics, you can, you can do both. Or economics and music, that you can do. Allow those double measures in undergraduate. That will show the demand of the uh, students and universities. Universities should uh, accommodate that. Tuition and salary. Okay, 
So we started this um, um, presentation. Um, I started this presentation with this 18 times difference intuition. And maybe Columbia is too, too expensive. But suddenly, the University of Tokyo is too cheap. I mean, they should charge higher tuitions. And uh, the money should be used for um, uh, uh, activities in the, in, in the universities. Of course, criticism is that what about the low-income families' uh, uh, children? Well, create the fellowship to those um, uh, uh, students coming from low-income families. But tuitions should be higher to show that this is a high-quality university and also get the foreign students and, um, uh, and give the value added, but charge high, higher tuitions. And, um, and incentives should be given to the higher, research, higher quality research with impact, which is citation. So there should be some incentives for the faculty members, graduate students who write the papers, get the patents, and make impacts to, to the world. I think that's the, um, very lacking uh, in, in Japan. And help young researchers. As I mentioned, I detailed why the young researchers in Japan were suffering uh, and disappearing uh, in the last uh, 20 years uh, because of this uh, institutional uh, change, which um, uh, disproportionately in, uh, had in adverse effect disproportionately to uh, young uh, researchers. Old ones are fine, but young researchers suffered quite a bit. Okay, and um, uh, scholarship for graduate <laughs> students and, and uh, postdocs, that's, that's the um, easy ones. Okay, so the um, challenges uh, to uh, retake reiterate is that can the university fund generate 3% returns? And my answer is yes. And I'm quite op optimistic about that if they adhere to the, um, the principle that we laid out uh, that 65-35 uh, 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 proportion and don't sell uh, in, in the market crash but buy. Um, Second is that whether Takubetsu University uh, can, uh, can use money wisely to lift their research ranking uh, higher and compete globally. I am less op optimistic on this question, and I want to see more sort of concrete uh, uh, planning and application in the Takubetsu uh, selection process. Thank you very much. Well, um, oops, sliding around a little bit. Um, that was fantastic. Um, um, and, uh, you know, I just think this is such an important topic for Japan. Um, I want to, uh, and it's something that I've been thinking about, and I'm actually, uh, uh, next week I have to teach some of this in, in, my, in my class on Japanese economy. And um, I wanted to start with, um, uh, you know, so, so I agree completely that that um, you know the 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 situation of of higher level education, as you documented in that in that initial chart, um, is uh, problematic for Japan uh, given the the income levels, and that uh, you know I think this does have a large impact on the ability of doing advanced research. But I want to try. To, I, I want to think a little bit um, more structurally about this. And, and I was really, I, I was um, struck by the the the, the, the fact that uh, University of Tokyo, which is uh, often thought to be the, the premier university in Japan, comes in at at a rank of twenty nine. And when I was thinking about that, I was also thinking about a book written by our colleague um, uh, Miguel Urquiola. Um, 
uh, on US universities and how did US universities rise, right? So um, if I asked people in this audience to name a famous US professor from the 19th century, you'd be scratching your heads. Um, and in general, US universities, as far as we can measure it in terms of Nobel Prizes and things like that in the 19th century, were pretty, pretty poor. Uh, all the activity was happening in Europe and nothing was happening in the United States. So there's always, this question that he addresses in his book is, is how did the US go from being nowhere in the 19th century to being um, um, kind of probably the, the premier um, uh, country in terms of top universities. And the answer is that unlike other countries, um, US universities tend to be, or the top ones, uh, tend to be private institutions. And just like private firms tend to outperform state-owned enterprises, um, private universities tend to outperform um, public institutions. And just let me give a simple example on the, on the um, something that's related to what you were talking about, the, the, the you know, can we hit a 3% return uh, in Japan? Um, I'll tell a tale of two private universities. One is uh, Harvard and one is Yale. Um, in the, uh, you know, at the, at the, certainly by, at the end of the Second World War, the early 1950s, Yale had a much larger endowment than Harvard. And Yale continued to fund, out fundraise Harvard consistently in the 50s and 60s. Um, but Yale's investment strategy was very similar to the Japanese investment strategy, which was invest heavily in bonds um, and don't, uh, don't be aggressive into stocks. And over time, uh, Harvard's performance in, in terms of returns was way ahead of Yale's performance in, 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 in its returns. And Harvard today, we now think of as, a, not, not what I think of, Harvard today is a much richer university than Yale. Yale has since changed its investment strategy. But it raises a question, which is, you know, is this, um, is this a system that's, that's, going not, that's, that's almost designed not to succeed when you're investing in a set of securities that are going to have lower returns and you're thinking long term, that doesn't sound like it's, it's, a, it's, it's a method for success. And another way of just raising a question, and I will turn this into a question in a moment, is um, I, I, I couldn't help but just look at that ranking of universities uh, and Tokyo coming in 29, and on some level that looks really poor, but another way of looking at that is to say, how does Tokyo rank against state-owned or, or, or public universities? And a lot of the universities in that top 29 are private, right? And if you throw out uh, universities that are technically public like um, Berkeley and UCLA and Michigan, which actually uh, have most of their money coming in from donations and endowment, so count those as privates. University of Tokyo is actually eighth among the publics. Okay, so it's not at the top, but it's kind of if you're in a public world, your Tokyo is doing okay. It's just that the rest of the world has kind of discovered there's a better way of running universities. And I guess this is a very long preamble to a question, which is, right, is the problem with the Japanese educational system the fact that you don't have um, private, you know, a lot of private universities that are fully self-financed and, um, um, and uh, competitive and feeling, you know, intense competitive pressure, you know, being in, U.S. universities, private universities, for for my entire career, you know, I can tell you that you know we're always looking at the competition and we're always trying to beat the competition. That is, uh, you know, central to our operations. And I get the sense that Japanese universities don't have that hunger uh, because they get big subsidies, and that may be the. And so my question is: Is that is that the problem? Is it a? Is it in some sense a? a poor model for being a top university? OK, so the answer is yes and no. Okay. 
Um, yes, in the, well, no, in the sense that there are private universities in Japan, and Keio and Wasada are most, two most well-known private universities, and they, they are not nowhere in top 200 in the ranking. So uh, they are not known for research universities. And um, uh, so it's, it's not uh, private versus public. It's, it's a Japan problem. That's uh, one answer. But second answer is that um, private universities in Japan behave like public university because they get 30% of operation budget from the uh, government. So in the sense that uh, they are semi-public and they cannot go too far from the ministry guidance. And, but they, they can maximize revenues by taking more students and teach in a large classroom, 500 students, 700 students taught by one professor. And that's very cost effective to get the um, uh, revenues. And I, I, you know, I know, you, you know, some professor in, in Japan teaching an intro to economics, 700 students, and he has to grade 700 <laughs> uh, uh, you know, exam. That's insane, right? Uh, we hire the uh, graduate students to uh, grade those um, uh, exams, and uh, they cannot do that in, in, in Japan. So, so what? So, but to me, as I'm as I'm as I'm hearing is, even the privates in Japan, the Keos and the Wasadas, you know, they're getting thirty percent of their budget from the government. My guess is that if one of those universities tried to do tries to raise tuition to make itself net, you know, uh, um, uh, to, to 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 raise funds so that it could hire and pay faculty more. My guess is that the Ministry of Finance, not the Ministry of Finance, excuse me, the Ministry of Education um, would cut its budget. Probably. Probably. So in that sense, it's not free to do. Right. And private universities uh, sense the possibility of the subsidy cut so they don't go too far uh, in raising tuition. So, but, so Miguel, uh, Miguel's work you, you, you mentioned, so the... He tries to explain how this um, uh, rise uh, of the uh, U.S. universities to the top research university. He argued that sort of reputation process that they hire high, high, highly reputable professors with high salary, and that attracts the uh, students, and they can charge higher tuition, and you climb this you know, virtual, virtual cycle. And um, um, so if the Japanese, one of the Japanese private universities want to go this route, then they can hire top-ranked uh, Tokyo University professors with double salary and double tuition and uh, go for that route. But probably they think that's um, less probable in success. They just go for the more students to, uh, to, um, uh, to get revenues, so. And, and, and I just, and, and I will turn it over to the audience in a moment, um, so people should think of questions while I'm, while I'm going, but I just wanna kind of push a little on the, on the funding model of mm -hmm. uh, US universities. So uh, you correctly cited the, the, the sticker price of Columbia, but um, one of the things about US universities is that uh, we, uh, price discriminate to an enormous extent, right? So foreigners, um, uh, foreigners pay full price, but very few uh, Americans pay full price. It's largely right when you, when you apply, uh, they you have to send in a financial aid form, or if, if you don't, you pay full price. So that's a way that the very rich uh, get get slammed with the sticker price. But overall, uh, at Columbia. Um, well, the sticker price, uh, roughly the average intake of tuition per student is about half what the sticker price is. And so there are a lot of students. Uh, my son went to Columbia. We paid nothing. <laughs> but, um, you know, a lot of students get, um, get financial aid. Um, and so 
it becomes a very progressive system. Um, and so I think, I think in Japan, there's probably a sense that, you know, oh, these universities are so expensive. But it's only for the very rich that they're that expensive, or for the foreigners that, are, that it's that expensive. And again, I think that part of this reflects, um, you know, as private institutions, we've figured out you know, how to, um, I mean, it's actually an, an, an incredibly efficient way of, of, of extracting money, right? Imagine if whenever you bought a car, they said, oh, show me your income, and then we'll, I'll tell you the price of the car, right? Most businesses can't, can't do that, but universities do it all the time. And that seems like a, an issue that's, that uh, private firms can kind of work out, or private universities can work out, but it's hard in Japan, is my sense. Um, well, it, even national universities, if they want to do it, they yeah, can they do will. it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but it was just a tremendous presentation. I really learned a lot, I, as always. But but this was uh, particularly gr uh, great. Um, and I just want to thank everybody here for uh, for for joining us tonight. Uh, so so first, um, everyone, if you could just uh, join me in a round of applause for for our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, uh, I also just want to again thank our, our corporate and individual sponsors uh, for all of your support. Uh, and thank you for joining. And uh, just as a uh, reminder to everyone, uh, it's not only we're not only providing uh, food for thought, but also some real food as well. Uh, there's going to be a reception uh, right afterwards, and uh, I think our staff will explain uh, how you can uh, get there. So again, have a good evening, and we'll, we'll see you in the reception. <laughs>